Good morning. It is good to see everyone here this morning. What a blessing to be where we can worship the Lord in freedom from harassment this morning. And not everywhere in the world do you get to have that opportunity uh, when you're worshiping the Lord. I'd like to invite Hannah to come back up and uh, give her her baptismal certificate and, ask, and have a special word of prayer with you, Hannah. Um, we're actually privileged to be able to have a baptism here in this place. You know, some places in the world you have to sneak around to have baptisms because if you're baptized, the next thing they want to do is they want to kill you. And uh, the Bible does say that all who would live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so for your, your walk of faith, you will find in life difficult moments and people won't always appreciate the decision that you've made to follow him. And, but we want to rejoice with you today, and we know that heaven is rejoicing with you. And I'd like to give you your baptismal certificate, and let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, just ask that you will be with Hannah in a special way. Ask that you will pour out your spirit on her. Lord, give her the courage of her convictions that you have laid on her heart of calling you her Lord and Savior. Bless her now, we pray, and for her life till you come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Before we get into God's Word, I just invite you, where you're sitting, to just whisper a prayer to God. Ask Him to help you hear what He wants you to hear this morning. And help me to say what He wants me to say, because without that, you won't hear it and I won't say it. And so let's just uh, uh, quietly seek the Lord and I'll pray up here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and thank you for your blessings. Thank you for Jesus. And Lord, we do ask for the forgiveness of our sins, the cleansing from all unrighteousness. Lord, we rejoice for what you've done in Hannah's life and in her heart today and ask that you will continue to be with her on the journey of faith. Lord, as we talk about that journey today, we ask that you will uh, bless our, us to hear your word. I ask for a coal from your altar to touch my lips that I might be able to speak for you in freedom and that your Holy Spirit will bless us all. Uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So faith is not always easy, is it? Uh, faith can be difficult. That's why you hear the saying from time to time. Maybe you've heard someone say it to you. Have you ever had anybody say, keep the faith? Yeah, it's kind of a, a one of those things. Uh, keep courage. Keep moving on. Uh, don't give up. God is there for you. He will always be there for you. Keep the faith. But faith is not always easy, and one of the reasons is is because faith is... Um, uh, something that Satan certainly doesn't want us to have. He is a great warrior out there on the opposite side of faith. He is the promoter of the standards of doubt, and he would like us to doubt God in every way possible. And so he doesn't want us to have faith, and uh, he'll do anything he can to interfere with our faith. And the word interfere, uh, Satan likes to especially highlight the word fear in interfere with our faith. And so he likes to bring in fear to interrupt our faith in God. The other, another thing that causes faith to be of a difficult nature is faith is controversial, right? Faith is controversial in our world. Uh, I, I told this story, and I'll tell it again. I was riding a chairlift with a young man up on Mount Bachelor, and he asked me what I did. And I said, well, I'm a pastor. And he says, well, what pastor? What church? And I said, well, the Seventh Adventist Church. And he says, um, tell me, what is the hardest thing about being a pastor? And I said, well, that's, I've never been asked that question before. And uh, I said, that's a very good question. I said, the hardest part of being a pastor is that we are promoters of faith, and faith is controversial. And uh, we're also promoters of a, a God that is a friendly God, a God who is a God of friendship, one who we don't have to be afraid of, one we can be a friend of. And uh, what that means is we try to be friendly and friends of everybody around us as pastors. But since we promote faith, not everybody wants that same faith, and that becomes controversial sometimes. And uh, that causes grief and heartache, and that's hard. Uh, being a uh, hard part about being a pastor is you want to build good bridges and good relationships with everybody you come in contact with, but you're promoting faith in God, and that not everybody buys, not everybody buys into that faith. But we want to talk about faith because all the difficulties that happen in life um, can challenge our faith in God. And we want to talk a little bit about that. First of all, what is faith? What is faith? 
We had the answer to that in our scripture this morning. Thank you, Benjamin, for reading that. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you can see it, touch it, handle it, whatever, you don't necessarily need faith to believe in it. you got the evidence right in your hand, right? It's the evidence of things not seen. If, you have it, or if, if you're hoping for something and it hasn't arrived yet, you have faith that it's going to come. Uh, if it's already there and you've already got your hands on it and it's already uh, been there, you don't have to hope for it anymore, right? Do we like to live by faith? Do we like to rather see and handle things or do we rather like to have things a little bit uh, ambiguous sometimes? Ambiguous. We like to, it's our human nature, I believe, that we like to have things where we can see it, handle it, touch it, and we like to have it right now. We don't want to have to hope for it. Uh, that's why there's the popularity of fast food and the media. Everything is so good, you don't have to wait very long. It comes right away. Now, is faith necessary in life? Is faith necessary in life? Well, if we're serving God in heaven, faith is absolutely necessary because you and I can't see him. We've only heard about him, right? We've only heard about him. Uh, someone's told us a story about Jesus. Someone told us about God, and we either choose to believe in it or we don't. But here's what God says about faith. It says in Hebrews 11.6, if you're in the book of Hebrews, you can look a little bit further in the chapter in verse 6, and it says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So God has designed our relationship with him to be a relationship of faith. And when we have faith in him, it pleases him. Now, what if we don't have faith? What if we don't have faith? Because sometimes faith is hard. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes we don't know if we have faith or not. Where does faith come from? Do you know that God actually provides the faith that we need to believe in him? It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, right at the end of the verse, it says, God has dealt to everyone a measure of faith. Right at the end of that verse in Romans 12, 3, it says, God has dealt everyone a measure of faith. And so when we hear about God, there is going to be in every single person a little bit of, you know, a responding cord of faith. Now, some people might want to tamp it down. Some people might want to get rid of it. Some people might want to stomp on it. Some people might want to forget about it. But God has created in every single person a measure of faith. Now, that faith can be strengthened. It's interesting in that uh, if you want that strength to, to go further and um, you want it to grow... Faith comes by hearing, the Bible says. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so if we want faith to increase, we've got to hear the word of God, and we want to listen to his word, get into it, study it, read it, maybe listen to a sermon, listen to someone preach about it. But uh, that's how faith builds is when we hear about something. You know this is true, right? Because if you haven't heard about something, it's hard to believe in it, right? But when you hear about it, then it's like, well, there must be something to that. Even if it may not be uh, what you want to hear, when we hear things, hearing is such a powerful tool, and God uses this tool to build faith in us. It is such a powerful, powerful thing. Our world likes to use a different sense to get our attention. What is the sense that our world likes to use mostly? Our eyes. Uh, the world likes to, to get us into things by our eyes. There's so much we can see, so much we can view, so much we can uh, go through uh, with our eyes to see it. But he, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, faith is something that we don't just have one day, and it just goes on, and we never have to exercise it ever after that, right? God dealt us a measure of faith, so when we hear about him, we have a choice. We can believe in it, but we have to exercise that faith because life is a journey, and every day brings its challenges, its obstacles, and its problems. One of the people in the Bible that the Bible 
calls the father of faith, as it were, is Abraham. Abraham was called from a land that he was living in comfortably with his family at 70-some years of old, and he was called by God to go to a land that God would show him. And he's like, I don't have any GPS. I don't have any map. I'm not sure where we're going. And when God calls you to go somewhere and he doesn't tell you where it is, and you go, that's faith. That is faith. So we have this, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, 8, we can actually read his story a little bit if you're in the book of Hebrews. Actually, Hebrews is a faith chapter. It talks about a lot of people that had faith in the Bible. It says in Hebrews eleven eight, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place which he should after receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing where he went. Do you ever feel like life's journey is I'm not really sure where it's all going? Uh, particularly when I was uh, about, oh, when I was in high school and I was my first couple years of college, and I still get it today, but particularly back then, I was like, Lord, where, where am I going? Where do you want me to go in life? You know, and you read these verses in the Bible, and like Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6, you know, and in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And you're like, oh, yes, praise the Lord, I got a promise, he's going to help me. But then I get up in the morning, and I'm like, Lord, I'm not really exactly sure what to do. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And I'd wrestle with this stuff. And I'd pray. And I'd go out on long walks. And I'd talk to the Lord. I'd look up at night. And I'd look at the stars. And I'm like, God, I know you're out there. You created all these stars. You created all this stuff. And I know you created me. And that's one of the steps of faith, too. Sometimes people don't believe that God has a plan or purpose for themselves. But God created each one of us. And we can look up to him. And we can say, God, what are you doing with my life? And where are you taking it? And if I don't know, that's okay, because I want to trust in you, but help me not to mess it up. You know? (laughs) He answers prayers like that. He answers prayers like that. And even if we do mess it up, God can still fix it. The stories in the Bible are story after story of where people messed up on their faith with God, and God helped them fix it. It starts with Adam and Eve in the very beginning. They lost their faith right off. The God says, you know, don't eat of this tree. It's going to kill you. And they believed it for a while, and then they lost their faith. You know, this word keep the faith, it's a good thing to keep. They lost it, and they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and sin came into the world. And uh, death and sorrow, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And this all came in. God was in the business of renewing faith with people. All through the Bible, you have prophets and you have God's messengers coming along to people and saying, believe in God. Follow God. And they do for a little while and then they don't. Finally, God says, I think I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to send my own son down there. And we'll see if they will respond to that. And he sends Jesus down and Jesus goes about doing good to everyone he meets. Healing the sick. Giving of his life to everyone. Forgiving those who have sinned. And people had a problem with that. They're like, how do you do that? And he's like, I do that. Because I'm going to die for your sin. I'm going to pay the penalty for your sin. And one day they lift it up on a cross And he paid the penalty for all of our sins. And we can choose to believe in a God who loves us that much. Yeah, he's God, he's big, he's holy. He created the entire universe by the words of his mouth. And we don't understand everything that he's up to. But we can understand one thing, that he's a God of love. I mean, what other God in history came down and sacrificed themselves for their people? Lots of gods wanted their people to sacrifice themselves for them. But Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so people caught the vision. They heard the voice. They heard the Holy Spirit speaking to them throughout the Bible and people like Abraham decided they're going to get up and go. 
and follow God, not knowing where they're going. Hebrews 11.9, it says, By faith he lived in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in a tabernacle with his sons Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. Verse 10, this is a proverbial, it applies to us too. He looked for a city whose foundations, whose builder and maker is God. You ever wonder why life seems to be always so transitory and why you always have to kind of, nothing ever seems to be for sure for forever? Always things are changing. For some people, it's a job change. For some people, it's family changes. For some people, it's uh, residence changes. You know, there's all kinds of changes that happen in life. There's no place in this world that is assured for certain place that we can root down in and say, this is it, we have arrived. Especially when we have faith in God. Because he says this world is passing away. And so even back in Bible times, they looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Abraham's story is an interesting story because he's an old man when he leaves. And uh, he's going to be the father of, of, as it were, the faithful. Faith was dwindling down in the earth. And so he calls Abraham and Abraham answers the call and he says, listen, I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to be the father of people of faith and there's going to be as the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. And Abraham's like, I'm going to be a father of all those people. I can't even number them. I don't have any children. And I'm 75. And his wife was right up there with him. And so they waited and they waited and they waited for the promise. And the promise never came. They never had any children. So they said, I know what we'll do. We will figure this out. We'll have a child. Sarah's like, I've got this Egyptian servant and you can have her and you can have a child with her. And this is how God's going to fulfill this promise to you. They did it, and it didn't work out. You can read the story in the Bible. It wasn't until Abraham was right around 100 and Sarah was 90 that they themselves conceived a child in faith. Faith is persistence. Faith doesn't give up. Yeah, they got detoured. They came up with the wrong plan. They went the wrong way. They reaped the painful results of that plan. But God was still there. He didn't give up on them. He showed up and he still showed in their lives. And he says, yes, I still want you. I want you, Abraham, and I want you, Sarah, as well. And so it says in the Bible in Hebrews 11, 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength, conceived seed, and, was deli- and delivered a child when she was past the age. 90's probably past the age, isn't it? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even from him, and the Bible describes him as good as dead. (laughs) You ever feel like you're as good as dead? Don't have any more potential in life? It's all behind you? Not much more in front of you? Well, Abraham was as good as dead, and he has his first kid. And then the results of this, as many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore. It's innumerable. I mean, we try to number everybody in the world, but it's still just a guess, right? We're around 7 billion something, but it's still, you know. There's a lot of people, and a lot of them came from Abraham. A lot of them did. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Because Abraham, what did he see? He saw one or two or three or a handful of children. He didn't see the stars in the sky number and the sands of the sea number. And we still haven't reached that yet, but it's it's happened and it's happening. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed them that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. In other words, they had a different plan of operation. They had a different way of doing things than the way the world around them did things. 
They were following after a God who loved them and gave himself for them. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. In Hebrews 11:14, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if it, they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So God's like, I see these people, they don't see me, they hear my word, they believe in me, I'm going to prepare something special for them. This is absolutely amazing, because Satan's sitting back and saying, God, nobody really likes you. They're kind of afraid of you. I mean, you don't do things the way they want you to do them. And so they doubt in you and they don't really love you and they, they're, they're fearful of, of getting involved with you. See, God, all this creation that you, meet, you made? You made a big mess. That's what Satan's saying to God. And God's like, well, wait a minute. Did you see this little crowd over here? This little group over here? They heard about me. They heard that I was a loving God. They heard that I created this world and it was good in the beginning. They heard that you, Satan, were the ones that actually messed it up through your temptations. And they're trying to stay away from you. And guess what, Satan? I'm preparing something amazing for them, though they've never seen me. Though they have not laid eyes on me, they believe. You want to hear about that city? It's talked about in the Bible from time to time. Back there in Abraham's day, they they talked about it. It says there in Hebrews. We get to Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Revelation 21. John, the revelator, the last writer of the Bible, he says in Revelation 21, 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. You know, it's an amazing thing that the God who created everything that we can see, feel, hear, and touch in our known universe by the word of his mouth decided to turn through Jesus himself into human flesh. Imagine yourself being able to do anything you wanted whenever you wanted to, however you wanted to, because you're omnipotent, omnipresent, you're everything. And then, like, Jesus is like, I'm going to save them. I'm going to come so identify with them. I'm going to give myself to the human race. I'm going to be born as a babe in Bethlehem, and I am going to keep that human flesh for all eternity because I love them so much. I'm going to dwell with them. They're going to dwell with me. I'm going to be their God, and they're going to be my people. So we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We mentioned that in the baptism. God the Father is still omnipresent. The Holy Spirit is still omnipresent. That means they're everywhere all the time. But Jesus limited himself to human flesh. He used to be omnipresent as well before he was born a babe in Bethlehem. Do you think that's a God of love? What would we give up? I mean, that's like handicapping himself for all eternity for you and me. And he's preparing this city. You know, John 14, 1 to 3 talks about it. says, you know, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And so John is talking about this here in Revelation. And here's a little bit of a description in verse 4, Revelation 21, 4. It says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be there any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he says in verse 5, Behold, I make all things new. And he tells John, Write, for these words are true and faithful. 
Verse 6, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be or she shall be my son and daughter. God has amazing things prepared for us. The Bible says, I has not heard and eye has not seen, ear has not heard of the things that God has prepared for those who love him. There's another verse in the Bible, and this is why people of faith keep the faith. It's this verse right here. I think it's Psalm 64, 4. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it says, I has not seen, ear has not heard of any God like our God who acts on behalf of those who call upon him. Anybody here ever called on the name of the Lord and the Lord helped them with something? Hallelujah. We can't see him, but you know, we know he's there. We know he's there. We can tell stories of how he was there. It's like, how else do you explain it? And the doubters will scoff. It's like, whoa, well, yeah, it could have been this, that, and the other thing. It's like, that's what you think. The Bible does have a little bit of a warning in Revelation 21.8. Actually, it has quite a bit of a warning. It says, outside the city, there will be the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the warmongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars. Those that chose a different way of faith and the love of God, God's not going to force them to be in his forever city. They do pass away in a lake of fire because God's in the business of going to make this world new again. He doesn't intend to necessarily want to destroy anybody. He's prepared the fire for the devil and his angels, but people that don't want to have anything to do with him, he's not going to force them to be inside the city, but he is going to recreate the earth and he purifies it by fire. The Bible calls this a second death. And we're like, well, what is, what is a second death? Isn't dying one time bad enough? What is a second death? Well, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So we all are born. We go through life. Some of us die when we're old. Some of us die in accidents. Some of us die when we get sick. Some people die in infancy. You know, that's, that's a death. That's a first death. But the Bible talks about two deaths. Not, not everybody realizes this, but John 5, 28 and 29 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Yes, there, are, there is a possibility to have a second death. Sometimes the wages of, you know, sometimes, I shouldn't say sometimes, the things that are done in this world that have been so unjust and so painful to other people God knows all about those things and he doesn't just write them off. He says, I'll take care of that one day. So a lot of people don't believe in God because they're like, God, you see that hurt and that pain that's going on? You're not doing anything about it. I'm not going to believe in you because you don't do anything about it. You're such a great and powerful God. God's like, wait, 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 wait. I'm not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. All should have eternal life. But he does have a day. When all those things, all those injustices, all those hardships, all those heartaches, and those people that inflicted them never backed down from them, never said they are sorry, never asked for forgiveness, never decided to turn their life around and get it cleaned up and made and put on the right way, and they shook their fists, as it were, in God's face and say, we don't want to have anything to do with faith, hope, or love, or healing. We're just going to be people of pain. God's like, well, I won't force you to be a person of love. I won't force you to be a person of faith or a person of healing or a person of joy. I won't force that. But if you insist on being a person of pain, beware that my healing of other people's pain will blot you out. Because God's a God of justice as well as mercy and forgiveness. So that second death 
is those that are resurrected to receive the consequences of perpetuating and proudly being promoters of pain. Yeah, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Here's an interesting thing. Do you know that the Bible says in Romans 14, 23, whatsoever is not of faith is sin? Whatever is not of faith is sin. We want to have faith. Jesus provides faith. We can strengthen faith by hearing God's word. Since eternal life is through Jesus Christ, then when we fall short on faith, what do we need? If faith, if not having faith in Jesus is sin, what do we need? We need Jesus, <laughs> right? He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. If we're falling short on faith, he comes back to us and invites us again. We need more time hearing of Jesus and his word to us. Fear interface, interferes with faith a lot. We want to spend time with Jesus so faith will interrupt our fears and banish them by his love. You know, back when I was in college, there was a bumper sticker on a lot of big pickups going through Nebraska and Kansas and the area where I lived. In the back of these pickup trucks, it said, No fear. Remember those? Yeah. I like that. I like those bumper stickers. I never got one to put on my little Volkswagen Bug in 1972. But um, <laughs> I like those bumper stickers a lot, uh, particularly because it was biblical. You know it was biblical? No fear. Although this is what the, actually the Bible says about it. In 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love. See? No fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment, and he that fears is not made perfect in love. So if we're having a problem with our faith, and if fear is interfering with our faith, we want faith to interrupt our fears. What we're going to have to do is have a bigger picture of God and his love. And so the only place we're going to get that is to spend time in God's Word reading about Jesus. When the, you, know, you know that song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so? We get that from the Bible. I mean, the song's not here, but the concept. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. biblical case study just in closing here of Jesus' disciples. He'd called them. He says, come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And he takes them for a three-year journey with them on, on faith. And they're getting it and they're getting it and they're getting it and they're getting it just to the point of the cross where they, they miss it. Turn with me to Matthew 26, verse 56. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verse 56 says, and this is right there in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before Jesus is taken away to trial. It says at the very end of verse 56, it says, Then the disciples forsook him and had great faith. Is that what it said? It says they forsook him and fled. It sounds like to me that fear interrupted their faith right then, right? Jesus was being taken away. They didn't really anticipate it happening this way, even though he had told them all the way along that this was the way it was going to go down that he was going to be lifted up for the sins of the world. He, was going, he talked about bearing the cross. But when it right came down to the moment, they forsook him and fled. You know, there are times when we go through life and we don't keep faith. They wanted to keep the faith. But the fear, Satan wanted to fear to interfere with their faith. 
So they fled. Jesus was lifted up on the cross. Nobody was there to stand with him, buy him, promote him, or anything, except for the thief on the cross. The I know John was down there with, his, with Mary, and some of the others were standing around at the foot of the cross, but they weren't saying much. The thief next to him put faith in him. So we have a record of one at that dreadful hour of exercising faith in Jesus. Imagine going all that journey from the throne of the universe down to the cross. And yea, he would have done it if there had only been one. If there was only one. If it was only you or if it was only me, he would have done it anyway. Because if that would have been the only person that ever confessed faith in him, he would have done it anyway. Meantime, his disciples, the ones that he had chosen to follow him, are holed up, locked behind closed doors. And resurrection morning arrives, and Jesus told them, I'm going to arise after three days. And, and resurrection morning comes, and in Matthew 28, verse 7, Mary is down there in the garden, and she meets up with Jesus. And he tells her in verse 7, Go quickly and tell the di- actually it's an angel there. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. Therefore you will s- there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So she goes back quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and runs and tells his disciples. And what did they do? They packed up their belongings and went to Galilee they were right now, didn't they? No. <laughs> They're like, yeah, well, right. You saw Jesus, or you saw an angel, and you think Jesus was resurrected? Yeah, whatever. So John and Peter go running off to the tomb to find out if this is so. They can't find him. Um, John outruns Peter and gets there. Two other disciples take off to go back to their town in Emmaus because they said this weekend's over. Jesus shows up and starts talking to them on the way, but his disciples are not headed to Galilee. And we'd like to think that our faith would be so strong that as soon as someone tells us Jesus is going to be in Galilee, you'll see him there after a horrible weekend like this, be running to Galilee. But they weren't. They didn't. They are locked up in their room. You get to the, the different stories in the end of the gospel Jesus actually shows up to them in their room. And what would you do with a bunch of people you'd call to follow you to be promoters of faith in the world and they're holed up and they won't even meet you at the designated appointment in Galilee? What would you say to such people? He walks in the room and he says, Peace be on to you. He knows what it's like. He knows it's hard to have faith sometimes. He asks us to have it. He gives it to us. He tells us how it can be increased. If you stumble and fall on the way, the Bible says the steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord. Though they fall, he will uphold them in his hand. So where does all this lead to? A lot of people would be like, oh, you're talking about a cheap gospel here. You know, here they stumbled and fell. They should be read the riot act. I'm just telling the story. Jesus came and said, peace be unto them. When a lot of us, if we're in the same situation, asking somebody to meet us somewhere and they didn't, read them the riot act, right? But what does this act of Jesus do? Does it cheapen the gospel? Does it cause them to become flamboyant sinners with proud and unholy hearts promoting pain throughout the rest of the then known world? Does this act of telling them to have peace beyond you, is that the effect that it had on them? No. They asked for forgiveness. They asked for forgiveness. I mean, it's not recorded in the Bible, but we know that by the time we get to the book of Acts that they're using that upper room now as a prayer room and they're praying to their God. And when you pray together, the Bible says that if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness.
And so as they're praying for his power to be the people that he wants them to be, they're confessing their sins, their shortcomings, they're pressing together as a group, they're reaching out to the Lord of love, the God of love, who has loved them enough to come down to this earth and forgive them of their sins, die on the cross for them, and then when they mess it up big time at the big event at the cross, he still comes to them with words of peace and invitation. That's love, greater love. As no man than this, he laid down his life for his friends. The Bible says that we love because he first loved us. And when we spend time thinking about these types of things, what does it do when you're in trouble? It increases your faith, doesn't it? It increases your faith. I'd like to close with a little thought because sometimes we cry out because we realize how far down the road we could be but we've only gone so far and we need more help and we don't even have the courage sometimes to call on the Lord. But these all continue, the Bible says in Acts 1.14 in one accord in prayer and supplication. Supplication in the Bible is oftentimes a time of tears as people are pouring out their heart in supplication to God in prayer. A little book called The Faith I Live By it says the tears of the penitent are only the raindrops that precede the sunshine of holiness. This sorrow heralds a joy which will be a living fountain in the soul. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that you have transgressed against me, the Lord your God. And I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am a merciful God, says the Lord. Jeremiah 3, 13 and 12. Unto them that mourn in Zion, he has appointed to give to them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You ever feel like your world's turned to ashes around you? God can bring beauty out of it. Ever feel like the pain is so deep you can't ever get it out? God gives oil of joy. Ever feel like life is so heavy you can't ever stand up straight again? Or look in the mirror, square in the mirror, he says, I'll give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It's the journey of faith, the walk of faith. So it's not that you will never fail in life on the journey of faith. And we don't have to fail on the journey of life with faith. The Bible says that. But if we do fail, what is the only solution? It's Jesus. He comes back to plant his faith in our life and faith becomes the victory. Can we sing that together? Our closing hymn is Faith is the Victory.